So hello everyone. My name is Dr. Anna Papard. I am a postdoctoral fellow and lecturer at Brock University, where I currently teach a course called the Superhero in American Culture. Superheroes are one of my academic specialties, and specifically representations of gender and sexuality in superhero comics. So when I heard my friend and colleague Dr. Andrew DeMann was running this course, I volunteered my services, and here we are. I've published a lot of material in this area, in addition to just thinking about it a great deal as an obsessive superhero comic book fan, which I have been since I was 12 years old and had my first intense celebrity crush on Dean Cain's depiction of Superman in the television show Lois and Clark, The New Adventures of Superman, and also my first queer crush on Terry Hatcher's depiction of Lois Lane in the same show, because, I mean, come on, get out of here. So good, these two. Um, I'm no longer 12 years old, clearly, and yet somehow I've managed to follow in the footsteps of my one-time idol Lois and find a way to be an adult woman who gets paid to write as much as she would like about why she loves Superman. Um, I do a great deal of that in my upcoming academic anthology, Super Sex, Sexuality, Fantasy, and the Superhero, which will be coming out in a few months, into which your professor and my friend, Dr. Andrew DeMann, contributes an excellent chapter about intersections of race and sexuality in comics starring the X-Men character Storm. Me and your prof are at the forefront of getting us to talk lots more and lots more seriously about superhero sexuality and why it matters. And that's what I want to talk to you about today first. Um, since this is your first class on superhero sexuality, I'm going to lay just a little bit of groundwork for you regarding the history of superhero sexuality and how it's historically been controversial, um, and how that superhero genre's conventionally problematic depictions of women intersect with that history. We will also, of course, be talking specifically about the character of Carol Danvers, a.k.a. Ms. Marvel, a.k.a. much later, Captain Marvel, and even more specifically, a famous or more properly infamous storyline from the 1980s that a fan writer slash critic, Carol Strickland, um, once again infamously dubbed the Rape of Ms. Marvel. So this story occurs in Avengers number 200 from 1980 um, by Jim Shooter, David Michelini, George Perez, and Bob Layton. And we will also look at Chris Claremont and Michael Golden's attempt to redress this unfortunate incident in Avengers Annual Number 10 from a year later in 1981. Um, I love the amount of things going on in both of these covers. I particularly love the way some of the things advertised on this cover are like a lot more exciting than other things. You get Cap being thrown through a play glass window, which is great, but then you get Iron Man just like lying unconscious in a field. I mean, <laughs> toss up, I guess. I don't know which one I want to see more. I'm just, I'm just so excited. <laughs> so as I mentioned, though, I think we can better understand some of the issues going on in these issues that you read for today by contextualizing them within some of the history of superhero sexuality, or what I like to call super sex. So the superhero genre, for all of its warranted reputation as being a patriarchal and misogynist space, is also a space of tremendous sexual possibility. The superhero genre's defining themes of transformation, disguise, and duality are ready-made to evoke queer experiences of hiding in plain sight as well as the liberation and consequences of coming out. These themes are amplified by the inherent deviance of superhero bodies, which routinely sprout sticky tentacles or fiery tendrils, merge with rock or metal, and liquefy, bend, stretch, or transform into a thousand different sex, sexless or multi-sex shapes. Even superhero bodies that don't do these things exist within a general atmosphere of gender and sexual deviance. Many superhero stories feature intense homosocial bonding and, of course, lots of flamboyant outfits for women, men, girls, boys, animals, aliens, and robots alike. Superhero comics are also littered with queer families, as we can see from this image of the Superman family at the bottom left. So this is a family that includes time-displaced cousins, double sets of human and alien parents, sentient animals, and mermaids. This is Silver Age Superman love interest Lori Lamaris down here, who is a mermaid. You see she's in this little pool of water. Traditionally and historically, however, female superheroes have not been allowed to fully participate in the superhero genre's tremendous capacity for sexual deviance, or at least they haven't been allowed to participate in an especially positive way. When female superheroes have expressed unconventional sexualities, they've been especially controversial. It is 1950 Bohr book Seduction of the Innocent, which was a big influence on the development of the censoring body, the comic book code authority. Clinical psychiatrist Frederick Wortham warned that comics featuring Batman and Robin promoted a homoerotic atmosphere. You will probably be talking about this again when you look at queer superheroes. This was, for the conservative culture of the 1950s, an alarming charge, but the consequences of reading Wonder Woman comics were, supposedly, even more dire. Wortham writes that for boys, Wonder Woman is a frightening image. For girls, she is a morbid ideal. 
Think about those words, morbid ideal. Think about what that means. Frederick Wortham is effectively suggesting that wanting to be like Wonder Woman is a kind of death. Too many girls wanting to be like Wonder Woman would, according to Wortham, bring about the end of the world, or at least the patriarchal world in which Wortham lived, which to many people from that era and our own era would have seemed like the end of the world. Many girls and women, of course, read these comics very differently. For feminists like Gloria Steinem, who put Wonder Woman on the cover of the first issue of Ms. Magazine in 1972, Wonder Woman was an inspiration. So in a sense, she lived up to Wortham's fears and did help change the world. Traditionally, however, comics producers have heeded Wortham's warnings. For decades, female superheroes have been diminished, minimized, and mistreated, in large part because of the ways in which their strength is downplayed in favor of their sexuality, and specifically their appeal to what we might commonly call the male gaze. Hopefully quite obvious in these images, but we'll go through a little bit about what I mean by that anyway. So I'm sure you've been talking about the male gaze in this course, or if you haven't yet, you will be. Um, so I'll do a bit of a refresher, but not a super in-depth one. We'll kind of run through this, some of this stuff quickly and then relate it back to Carol Danvers. So one of the most influential treatments of the objectification of women in popular visual culture is Laura Mulvey's 1975 article, Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema. According to Mulvey, popular cinema privileges a male viewpoint or male gaze, which constructs women as bearers of meaning rather than makers of meaning. In classical Hollywood cinema, says Mulvey, women serve a symbolic rather than a narrative purpose, and what they symbolize is erotic spectacle. According to Mulvey, in a world ordered by sexual imbalance, pleasure in looking has been split between active slash male and passive slash female. In their traditional exhibitionist role, women are simultaneously looked at and displayed, with their appearance coded for strong visual and erotic impact, so that they can be said to connote, and I love this term, to be looked addedness. Woman displayed as sexual object is the leitmotif of erotic spectacle. In other words, in films that privilege the male gaze, women are constructed not as subjects, but as erotic objects, to be looked at both by the male characters within the film and by the male-identified spectators watching the film. Importantly, it's not just men who view things through the male gaze. When a film is shot using a male gaze, everyone who's watching it is compelled to share that subject position. Women, as well as men, are compelled to look through and privilege the male gaze. We can see the male gaze at work in an image like this of Marilyn Monroe in the film The Seven Year Itch. Notice how Monroe's erotic display is watched by the man at the left of the frame. As viewers, whether we're men or women, we're solicited to identify with this guy, watching the display of this woman. In a way, we can't help but identify with him. If we watch Monroe, we are, by default, sharing his viewpoint, his male gaze. In an image like this, too, of Rita Hayworth, notice how the woman is constructed as an aspect of the aesthetic landscape. Notice the way her smooth skin and soft round curves mirror and mimic the satin sheets she's posed on. Images like this, according to the critic Annette Kuhn, promote the ideal woman as being put together, composed of surfaces, and defined by appearance. She's constructed as a luxury good, a living doll, something that can be purchased and owned, even as the bed and sheets can be purchased and owned. In classical Hollywood cinema, any attempt to identify with the woman on the screen as more than an object is routinely frustrated by the way she is filmed. Women are often displayed in pieces. This fragmentation helps to deprive women of their subjectivity. Close-ups of legs, behinds, high-heeled shoes, and even extreme close-ups of made-up faces help to construct the woman as a series of consumable parts rather than a whole person. Even though Mulvey was primarily talking about movies from the 40s and 50s, many of her observations are just as applicable to films made today. And this film is a little, few years old by now, but probably still something that you recognize. So the depiction of Megan Fox in Transformers, for instance, owes a substantial debt to the earlier objectification of Monroe and Hayworth. The clothes may be different, but the intent is the same. The woman is dressed, shot, and framed in such a way that she becomes an object, a consumable spectacle for the male gaze. She's still framed for erotic consumption, divided into parts and compared to objects. I particularly wanted to draw your attention to this motorcycle one. Notice how Megan Fox's curves um, mirror and mimic the shape of the motorcycle. It is a very literal instance of objectification. And Mulvey's observations can also be applied fairly directly to superhero comics. To illustrate this, the Tumblr The Hawkeye Initiative, which invites fans to redraw poses of female superheroes featuring the male superhero Hawkeye, was specifically created to mock and deconstruct the use of what's colloquially called the brokeback pose in comics starring female superheroes. 
The Brokeback Pose is exactly what it sounds like. It refers to the broken spine that would be required for women to successfully display their breasts and rear ends simultaneously, as they are often shown doing in superhero comics, even or especially in the middle of fight scenes. Basically, fight scenes in superhero comics are often treated as an excuse to show off a female superhero's erotic assets, rather than a showcase of her strength. So to be clear, the subjectification isn't just a problem because it's sexist, because it promotes normal, i.e. patriarchal, gender roles and hierarchies. That is part of the problem, but it's not the only problem. The objectification of female superheroes is also a problem because of what it does for our ability to identify with female superheroes. In general, female superheroes are faced with the challenge of trying to be heroic subjects while being drawn as sexual objects. As the critic Jeffrey Brown describes, although the female action hero, this is a quote from Brown, represents a potentially transgressive figure capable of expanding the popular perception of women's roles and abilities. In her persistent, gender-specific objectification, she also runs the risk of reinscribing strict gender binaries and of being nothing more than sexist window dressing for the predominantly male audience. And in terms of the limiting of subjectivity, I picked this image in particular because these characters are very different ages, they're different ethnicities, they have very different power sets, and yet their bodies and poses are almost identically the same. Um, anything that was unique about these characters is being reduced to having them fulfill a very specific version of the male gaze. Essentially, objectification matters because it threatens the subjecthood of female superheroes. By encouraging us to think about female superheroes as objects, superhero comics discourage us from thinking about female superheroes as subjects, which means female superheroes end up filling a very different need than male superheroes. Male superheroes are meant to be ego ideals. They're meant to be larger, better, more perfect selves for men and boys to identify with and aspire to be. Female superheroes, because of their objectification, don't work like that. Too often, female superheroes aren't presented as someone to be or even be with. They're represented as something to have, to possess, to own, like you would own an object. You don't have to worry about the feelings or desires of an object. You don't have to worry about an object's subjecthood, because an object doesn't have subjecthood. One consequence of this is that girls and women aren't encouraged to be heroes. Another consequence is that boys and men aren't encouraged to view women as people. Both of these consequences are dire, or even, to repurpose Wortham's phrasing, morbid. It's also important to note that the subjecthood of female superheroes is, generically, threatened both visually and narratively. This is where I'd like to introduce you to the trope called fridging. The term fridging is one you might have heard before. It was coined by the writer Gail Simone and is named after a 1994 Green Lantern comic book in which the hero arrives home to find his murdered girlfriend's corpse stuffed in his refrigerator. Fridging describes instances of female superheroes being killed, maimed, or depowered for no other reason than to motivate or inspire emotion in a male love interest or relation. So Gail Simone didn't just coin this term. In the late 90s, she also created a website called Women in Refrigerators, which you can see a screen capture of here, documenting fridging, where users could contribute examples. This was a really important form of fan activism on the relatively early internet. Um, you can see this is from 1999, this message from Gail here. And one of the things this activism revealed is that virtually every female superhero in existence had been, at one point in her career, a victim of sexual violence. I'm not exaggerating, it is almost every single one. This is almost a given in some sense for the pure and simple problem that because the bodies and costumes of female superheroes are heavily sexualized, the violence they're involved in as superheroes is somewhat inevitably sexualized as well. But it's also specifically exaggerated and emphasized, visually and narratively. To start to get a sense of that, let's look at some covers starring none other than Ms. Marvel, aka Carol Danvers, contrasted with her male inspiration, Captain Marvel. So here are some covers featuring Captain Marvel, the male counterpart of Ms. Marvel. Um, and they obviously share a costume design and a history, these characters, so they're, they're kind of male and female equivalents. So these covers featuring the male Captain Marvel could be considered sexualized in as much as the hero's costume highlights his body, we see him stretching and straining in a potentially sexualized way. Um, we also see him humbled and made vulnerable, which is gender deviant to the extent that maleness is conventionally defined by hardness and penetrability and self-control. Yet there's a pretty big difference, I would argue, between these Captain Marvel covers and these Ms. Marvel covers. So these are all from Ms. Marvel's solo series from the 1970s that would have directly preceded the issues that you read for today. So a few things to look for when assessing depictions of, of potentially sexualized violence. You can think about 
framing. What is emphasized? Context. Is it warranted? You can think about things like passivity versus activity. Um, does the way that the character is reacting to the violence, um, does that connote their character? You can think about costuming. Is the costume torn? What type of costume is the character wearing? You can also think about something like sexual metaphors. Um, we are going to be seeing a number of phallic symbols in these covers. So let's take a look at some of the Captain Marvel and Ms. Co Marvel covers side by side. So here we go. Tentacles versus tentacles. Um, <laughs> tentacle porn is a whole thing, which you are free to look up if you want to be scarred for life. Um, so what do you notice is different about the framing here? Um, we see much more of Ms. Marvel's body, don't we? Specifically, we're looking up her long, bare legs here um, toward her crotch, and we have a very nice view of her impossibly firm breasts. Keep in mind she's underwater here, but still looking great. We can think too about passivity versus activity. How are the expressions of the characters different? How would you describe Captain Marvel's expression relative to Ms. Marvel's? I'd say that Captain Marvel is a bit fearful, but mostly he's angry and aggressive. Ms. Marvel, though, looks frightened and overwhelmed. And you can think about, is that appropriate to a female superhero who has the same powers as this male superhero? Is this really a situation, you know, scary as it is, that would really be this threatening to a woman who's invulnerable, who has super strength, who can fly? The costuming aspect is a bit obvious. Captain Marvel's costume exposes much less skin than Ms. Marvel's, which is designed to be feminine and erotic in a way that the male superheroes is not. We can also think about sexual metaphors. That's a touch different, um, difficult rather, in this image, since tentacles are generally phallic, so in a sense they're both being threatened with a phallic object. Um, but I'd argue that given her pose and costuming, Ms. Marvel is threatened with penetration in a way that Captain Marvel is, is not. Let's look at another pairing. So we could run through the same list of factors here, which are pretty much the same as from the last cover. But the thing I'd suggest is the most important here in this example is the passivity versus activity equation. Captain Marvel is actively resisting, but Ms. Marvel is not. And her passivity assists in her objectification. By having her unconscious, the artist has an excuse to pose her more erotically. Her will, her subjecthood, is taken away in the interests of her objectification. Here's another one. So note the torn costume on Ms. Marvel, while Captain Marvel has no such torn costume. And once again, the fearful expression of Ms. Marvel, which we don't see in the Captain Marvel image. And of course, phallic imagery. Ms. Marvel is helpless on the ground with her legs spread, her costume torn to expose even more skin, and emphasize her helplessness while a very large, very long gold gun is aimed directly down at her. And the gun, in fact, dominates the scene. So one more, just to, pardon the expression, hammer home the point. Here we get Captain Marvel and Ms. Marvel together. She is helpless on the floor, once again fearful, once again with her costume torn, once again threatened with a phallic weapon, while Captain Marvel is aggressive, on his feet actively resisting, and actually thrusting down toward Ms. Marvel's supine form. And I'm sorry, I know that was kind of a gross description, but in my defense this is kind of a gross image. So when assessing depictions of violence, um, particularly sexualized violence, because that's what we're specifically looking at today, these are some of the things, again, to recap, to, to, to stay aware of. Framing. What is emphasized? Context. Is it warranted? Passivity versus activity. Does it prioritize the subjectivity of the protagonist? Think about costuming. What is the costume? Are there torn costumes? And especially sexual metaphors, once again. So this type of imagery is not confined to the 1970s, which is when these covers were from. So here are some covers from Ms. Marvel's 2006 series, where you see her wearing the black costume with the gold lightning bolt that she wears in Avengers number 200. While Ms. Marvel is displaying some slightly more active poses and expressions here, this imagery is also clearly exploiting violence to additionally sexualize her. And humble her, I would argue, as well. So getting back to fridging, though... The fact that fridging is named after a comic book from the early 90s is significant, because in some sense, even though linking female superheroes with sexual violence is a very old and pervasive convention, fridging is a relatively modern one. Before the grim and gritty superhero comics of the 1980s, death and permanent disability were rare in superhero comics. So, fridging was consequently rare as well. But it increased as a convention and became significantly associated with sexual violence in the early to mid-1980s, when superhero comics supposedly started getting more serious or adult. The mid-1980s saw the release of iconic revisionist and deconstructive superhero stories like 
Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons' graphic novel Watchmen, Frank Miller's Dark Knight Returns, and Moore and Brian Boland's Batman The Killing Joke. These three comics are most, among the most fondly remembered and critically praised and best-selling superhero comic books of all time. They've been adapted many times into other mediums and continue to be reprinted and sell well. And all three texts feature sexual assaults of female characters, at least two of which, and arguably all three, are textbook examples of fridging. The Killing Joke is perhaps the most egregious in this regard. In this comic, Batgirl, aka Barbara Gordon, shows up in the comic just to answer the door and has her spine immediately broken by the Joker, who then takes naked pictures of her maimed body to torture her father, Commissioner Gordon, and Batman. We never see in this comic anything of Barbara's reaction to what happens to her. Her assault exists solely to motivate the male characters and shock the audience with this comic's supposed maturity. And just to emphasize how, how central this event is in the comic, you see the classic cover of the comic here of him with the camera. And here's him with the camera, ready to take the pictures of Barbara Gordon. So DC Comics has never properly owned up to this error in judgment. Though Gail Simone, the same woman who coined Fridging, helped resurrect Barbara as a powerful disabled superhero called Oracle, and Barbara has since had her ability to walk restored, the killing joke is still pushed as a defining aspect of Barbara's character. Um, I'm going to give a content warning for this next cover because I think it is actually quite disturbing. Um, I know that you've probably talked about, you know, content warnings and stuff in this course already, but um, just thought I would give you a heads up because this image does um, evoke sexual violence quite directly. So, fair warning. So I wanted to show you this 2015 variant cover for Batgirl number 41 by Raphael Albuquerque. So, referencing the killing joke. This cover did, thankfully, generate enough controversy that it was eventually cancelled, but the fact that the company thought this would be a good image to sell a comic that was, in 2015, explicitly trying to market itself to girls and women speaks to a major lack of understanding. So let's spend just a little bit more time thinking about what the problem specifically is with an image like this, and with tropes of sexual violence and fridging more generally. Yes, superheroes are always subject to violence. This is true of superheroes of all genders. And yet, whereas virtually every female superhero has, at some point, been subjected to rape or another form of sexual assault or violence, male characters almost never are. Female superheroes bear the brunt of sexualization within the superhero genre, and they also bear the brunt of its sexual violence. Importantly, too, rape is a particular kind of gendered violence. As the critic Sharon Marcus describes, rape is neither sex nor simple assault, but rather a sexualized and gendered attack which imposes sexual difference along the lines of violence. Rape engenders a sexualized female body defined as a wound, a body excluded from subject-subject violence, with the ability to engage in a fair fight. Rapists do not beat women at the game of violence, but aim to exclude us from playing it altogether. Rape of women by men, in other words, is a gendered attack on subjecthood, an attack on a woman's ability to be more than an object. And we can see this playing out on a cover like this. Think for a moment what message a cover like this is sending to a girl who might see it on a comic book stand. It's telling her that no matter how powerful she is, no matter how strong she is, no matter how much she trains, no matter how hard she works, no matter how good or selfless or heroic she is, her body is always vulnerable. Her subjecthood is always at risk. All it takes is one knock on the door to take away her safety and sense of self. And this is very different from the messages male superheroes deliver for boys and men. Though male superheroes often get hurt and often even traumatized, they don't have their subjecthood constantly threatened in this same way. Once again, I can't emphasize enough that these things have real consequences, real connection to real life. And I'll use my own experience as an example here. I remember exactly where I was when I first saw this cover. I was in my home office working on a PhD dissertation about the representation of women in superhero comics. At that time, I was also teaching a university course on comics that featured many discussions of these issues. I was also discussing these issues often on fan forums. This cover came across my desk via a comic book news site I regularly visited, and when I saw it, I felt physically ill. It made me feel like all the work I was doing, all the writing, all the teaching, all the explaining I was doing about why these types of representations are a problem were falling on deaf ears. For 30 years, women and men had been explaining why the treatment of Barbara in The Killing Joke was a problem. And when I saw this cover, it was clear we weren't being listened to. Our subjecthood, our subjectivity, our experience still wasn't being respected, much as Barbara's wasn't. 
I am not suggesting that seeing this cover is equivalent to being sexually assaulted. That would be profoundly irresponsible. What I am suggesting, though, is that the decision to create a cover like this, the original decision to assault Barbara Gordon, and the real preponderance of sexual violence in our society, which disproportionately targets women, come from a similar place. A place where female subjecthood is not being respected. A place where women as treated are treated as objects rather than subjects. To once again be clear, the fact that a comic or a superhero comic specifically includes sexual violence does not necessarily make it bad, or an example of fridging. What's problematic is how widespread it is, the fact that virtually every female superhero has experienced it, as well as how it's depicted. When you encounter sexual violence in any type of comic, you want to ask yourself, what is this sexual violence doing? Is it here to do something or say something productive about violence or gender? Or is it present on the flip side to be titillating or erotic? Or exciting. These questions in mind, let's turn for the rest of our time today to Carol Danvers. So the rape of Carol Danvers, even though fantasy metaphors are employed, it is rape, is bad on its own for the reasons I've already discussed. It undercuts the character's subjecthood and subjectivity in deeply problematic ways. But what happens to Carol Danvers is also extra problematic and extra telling because of who the character is historically. These are some various depictions of the Ms. Marvel and Captain Marvel identity, including the new Ms. Marvel, Kamala Khan here, who you may have heard of. So a little bit of history. Ms. Marvel, aka Carol Danvers, is a former security chief with the United States Air Force, turned second wave feminist magazine editor, turned Avenger, turned cosmic hero, turned alcoholic, turned post-feminist, turned third wave feminist. She's been a lot of things and represented a lot of contradictions and types of female strength. What I really want to emphasize for you today, though, is the feminist roots of this character, the ways she was created to try and resonate with specifically second wave feminism and appeal directly to girls and women. So this is the debut of Carol Danvers as Ms. Marvel in Ms. Marvel No. 1 from 1977, written by Jerry Conway with art by John Buscema. The first scene of Ms. Marvel No. 1 shows her flying through the sky, delivering roundhouse punches, and throwing a car full of escaping bank robbers. This level of raw physicality was very unusual for female superheroes during this time. Conventionally, female superheroes of the 1960s and 70s had what are often called strike a pose and point powers. Basically, if you're a female superhero during this era, you've got force fields or telekinesis or some kind of magic or energy ray power that lets you stand far away from the fight, cock your hip in a cute or sexy pose, and just point at the battle instead of getting your hands dirty. It's basically the stereotype of throwing like a girl with the added sexualization component of it allowing female superheroes to keep their looks intact in the heat of battle. Ms. Marvel's introduction, in contrast, establishes her similarity to history's first and most famous superhero, Superman, who also made a memorable first impression by throwing a car. Here we see her here, throwing the car, right? Ms. Marvel's physical power, power is also immediately foregrounded as an aspirational ideal for girls and women. In the affirmation opening scene, which we are still looking at here, a little girl, wide-eyed at Ms. Marvel's display, which is what right here, um, points to her and says, Mommy, I've never seen a woman like that, have you? The little girl's mother replies, No, Susie, never. The girl then exclaims, Wow, when I grow up, I want to be just like her. Probably clear, but just in case it wasn't, the scene emphasizes the intention, or perhaps the conceit, that Ms. Marvel could become a hero for a new generation of women, serving as both a model and a metaphor for women's liberation. Ms. Marvel is also explicitly aligned with feminism. In issue number one, Danvers is hired by Daily Bugle publisher J. Jonah Jameson, the, <laughs> the pain in the side of Spider-Man, as many of you might be aware. Um, he's hired by her to edit a new magazine called Woman Magazine. In creating this magazine and hiring Danvers, Jameson is, like Marvel, attempting to attract new female readers in an erstwhile male-dominated media empire. However, Ms. Marvel No. 1 emphasizes Marvel and Jameson's different goals and strategies. In describing the content of his previous publications aimed at women, Jameson, a stereotypical male chauvinist pig, vehemently rejects feminism. He says, Articles on women's lib, interviews with Kate Millett, stories about careers for women, yuck! Jameson wants woman to be a more traditional woman's magazine, offering new diets and fashions and recipes, and of course, a scathing condemnation of Ms. Marvel, the new female superhero. Danvers, and by extension the company of Marvel Comics, subsequently demonstrates a heroic commitment to feminism by refusing to write about diets, fashion, or recipes, and of course producing a pro-Ms. Marvel piece. 
Uh, the scene in context is a crucial site of negotiation. It allows Marvel to criticize a patriarchal publishing industry while privileging itself above such criticism because it publishes the purportedly feminist Ms. Marvel. Ms. Marvel's feminist credentials are further bolstered by the first splash page of Ms. Marvel number six, which features a close-up of Woman number one magazine um, with an image of Ms. Marvel on the cover. So this image makes very clear Marvel's effort to connect Ms. Marvel slash Carol Danvers to feminist icon Gloria Steinem, the co-founder of Ms. Magazine, which, as mentioned earlier, featured the world's most iconic female superhero Wonder Woman on the cover of its 1972 debut. This alignment with Steinem and Ms. Magazine against the extravagant show chauvinism of J. Jonah Jameson represents a significant acknowledgement of institutionalized sexism as a problem worth addressing. However, the writers and editors of Ms. Marvel would often struggle to understand or admit their own implication in this sexism, as exemplified by writer-editor Jerry Conway's introduction at the end of Ms. Marvel No. 1. In his letter, Conway exploits the notion of gender equality to assert a man's ability and right to create a feminist-inspired female superhero, says Conway. If the woman's liberation movement means anything, it's a battle for equality of the sexes, and it's my contention that a man, properly motivated and aware of the pitfalls, can write a woman character as well as a woman. Um, this statement is not untrue, but it also serves a convenient excuse for the absence of a female writer from this and so many other Marvel titles. Conway similarly invokes feminism in his defense of Ms. Marvel's naming. So Ms. Marvel's name can be considered problematic in as much as it links the arguably links and arguably subordinates her to the male superhero Captain Marvel, whose name, unlike that of Ms. Marvel, connotes institutional authority. This subordination is further exaggerated by the fact that Captain Marvel is also the source of Ms. Marvel's imagery and powers. Like Eve created from Adam's rib, Ms. Marvel gains her superpowers when her DNA is merged with that of Captain Marvel in a super scientific accident. In his letter, Conway ignores these issues in favor of asserting the importance of the Ms. prefix as a statement of female independence. Writes Conway, Ms. Marvel's name, if nothing else, is influenced to a great extent by the move toward women's liberation. She is not a Marvel girl. She is a woman, not a Miss or a Mrs., a Ms., her own person, herself. Ultimately, Conway's letter emphasizes Ms. Marvel's feminism in ways that downplay and even dismiss possible feminist criticisms. In spite of, or perhaps in response to its problematic invocations of feminism, Conway's letter spurred a debate about the representation of female superheroes that would continue in Ms. Marvel's letter pages until the title's cancellation at issue number 25. Many readers, including Miss and Proud of It, Mary Catherine Gilmore, whose letter appears in issue 4, felt that the creation of Ms. Marvel provided an opportunity to comment on the blatant sexism running rampant among the pages of Marvel and your distinguished competition. Significantly, girls and women are a consistent presence in the letter pages of Ms. Marvel, averaging 50% of the total published letters. While it's impossible to know whether this percentage came close to reflecting the title's actual readership, it does confirm a mandate to make it seem as though girls and women were reading the title, though not, importantly, in greater numbers than boys and men. It's beyond the scope of this lecture to detail all the fascinating debates that play out in Ms. Marvel's letter pages. But I did want to emphasize that these debates um, reflect female readers' sort of deep awareness of the problems featuring um, female superheroes in, in mainstream comics. This criticism by Debbie Lip, I think, is particularly interesting. So the slogan, This Female Fights Back, was included on the front of the issue for some time. And as Debbie Lip points out, this female fights back is blatantly sexist and that it implies that other females don't fight back, that it is, in fact, unusual and entertaining that a female should fight back. These disagreements about what Ms. Marvel does or should mean effectively illustrate the contradictions informing the creation and depiction of female superheroes, and how these contradictions also appear within feminism itself, as re well as real women's lives and imaginations. It's very difficult to have one female superhero who's going to represent every woman's understanding or conception of female strength. That's sort of part of the problem with having one superhero that's going to represent all women, all of feminism. Overall, Ms. Marvel's plots and imagery mirrored and no doubt substantiated the dissonance of these letter pages. For the first dozen issues of her series, Danvers suffers from a highly gendered personality disorder. For the first several issues, she's not even aware that she and Ms. Marvel are the same person, her transformations into her superheroic alter ego being triggered, as the critic Alex Boney describes, by fainting spells and blackouts which had been used to signal female hysteria and instability for centuries. 
So even though some of Marvel's male superheroes, most notably the Hulk, could also be said to suffer from hysteria, there are specific meanings and consequences to depicting a female superhero as hysterical. The 19th century discourse of hysteria situated the female body as always lacking and needing control. Because hysteria was viewed as both normal, a, a, a normal aspect of womanhood, and a pathology, it defined women as essentially pathological, as somehow inherently abnormal or disturbed. Consequently, using the signs of hysteria to signal Danvers' transformations into Ms. Marvel suggests either that women are inherently pathological, abnormal, and disturbed, or that they become this way when they become superheroes. In essence, this trope suggests that becoming a superhero makes a woman ill. Ms. Marvel's constantly changing costume reflects and compounds her uncertain identity. In issue 9, Ms. Marvel's exposed back and midriff are covered up, making her costume less sexualized and more practical. Yet in issue number 20, which we see here, she's flagrantly resexualized, swapping her bright primary colors for a shiny black ensemble consisting of a backless bathing suit, thigh-high thigh heeled boots, and long gloves accompanied by a much longer, fuller blonde hair. Arriving so close to the title's cancellation, it's difficult not to read this final costume change as a last-ditch effort to save the title by abandoning a demonstrably fickle female readership in favor of a franker appeal to the more dependable male gaze. And then we have Avengers number 200. So this comic was released shortly after Ms. Marvel's solo series was cancelled. To recap the Ms. Marvel portion of this comic, <clears throat> Ms. Marvel has an abnormally rapid pregnancy that ends with a very unusual birth. Her child grows rapidly to adulthood and announces that he is, in fact, her lover, who impregnated her with himself to escape from a lonely, timeless limbo. But it gets worse. This immortal space dude, Marcus, openly confesses that he kidnapped Ms. Marvel, brought her to his dimension, and used magic and a subtle boost from his dad's mind-altering technology to make her fall in love with him and do this whole impregnating her with himself thing. Ms. Marvel accepts this explanation, declares that she loves Marcus in return, and agrees to spend her life by his side in his home dimension. This storyline's writer, well, one of its writers, David Michelini, um, claims that it was never intended to invoke rape or incest, and that its convolutedness was simply the result of trying to meet a tight deadline. I am willing to believe he thinks this is true. I would also suggest, though, that when we're up against tight deadlines, we tend to fall back on tropes. We fall back on stereotypes. And tropes and stereotypes don't come from nowhere. This story is in conversation with a long history of sexism and misogyny and mistreatment and diminishment of female superheroes. The fact that Marvel gets rid of their most overtly feminist female superhero by having her be impregnated by and give birth to her rapist, then declare her love for said rapist and run off to spend the rest of her life with him in another dimension, seemingly never to be seen again, says a lot about the company's willingness to continue incorporating feminism within their stories. Carol Danvers was a problem. She was a controversy almost since the day she was created. And a company interested in selling escapism primarily to young men wasn't, by 1980, interested in those kind of problems. So Carol Danvers was raped and disposed of, and no one thought it was a problem. Except some people did think it was a problem. Most famously, the fan critic slash writer Carol Strickland, who I mentioned earlier in the lecture, who wrote what's become a somewhat infamous essay called The Rape of Ms. Marvel in this fan scene, LOC. In her essay, Strickland explicitly labels what happens to Ms. Marvel rape, and challenges not just Marvel, but other fans as well, and especially male fans, for their complicity in creating and consuming such a story. I'm just going to read you a couple of quotes from, from Strickland's essay. Am I just overly sensitive or what? I know that I have a tendency to shoot my mouth off about the role of women in comics, but shouldn't everyone be concerned when a comic displays a struttingly macho, misogynist storyline that shreds the female image apart with a smirk and rewards the one who did the shredding? I should think that such a story would create an uproar in fandom, but then where is there even a whisper of discontent? I realize that females are only a small part of comics readers and fandom, but it should not just be the women who raise the roof over such a story. It should be everyone. Isn't everyone entitled to respect as a human being? Shouldn't they be against something that so self-consciously seeks to destroy that respect and degrade women in general by destroying the symbol of womankind? In essence, Strickland is asking why rape has to be the sole problem or concern of women. She's calling out men who don't care about how problematic this story is as complicit in what we sometimes call rape culture. When we think about rape as a woman problem, we're effectively blaming women for rape. It becomes women's responsibility not to be raped, rather than men's responsibility not to rape women. 
Similarly, by ignoring the rape of Carol Danvers in Avengers number 200, male writers and fans are abdicating responsibility. Men created the story and were the primary consumers of this story, yet they don't, somehow, see its depiction of rape as having anything to do with them. They didn't even see it as rape, they just saw it as a conventional superhero story, which tells you something about how conventional it was to inflict sexual violence on female superheroes. Chris Claremont, the longtime writer of Uncanny X-Men, felt similarly to Strickland about Avengers number 200. Claremont notably wrote almost all of Ms. Marvel's original solo series, so the, the solo series was started by Jerry Conway. Um, Chris, Chris Claremont wrote um, most of the issues from, I believe, issue number five to the end of the series. So Claremont had an affinity with the character, and in Avengers Annual number 10 from 1981, he tries to fix, or at the very least address and confront, what was done to Carol Danvers by other creators. Like Strickland does in her essay, Carol Danvers confronts the Avengers about their complicity in her rape. Some things to look for as you unpack Danvers' confrontation with the Avengers um, is how her subjecthood is emphasized, both narratively and visually. So look at the scene where she confronts the Avengers. Notice how it's composed and framed. I'm particularly thinking about this panel at the top here. We as readers are positioned with Carol Danvers looking out at the Avengers. Um, I could do without the short robe that gives us a hint of her behind here, but apart from that, we're seeing through her eyes. We're looking at these people who betrayed her. We're feeling her pain. On the one hand, this makes us and Carol have to relive the pain. On the other hand, it puts the Avengers on the spot. They're subject to our controlling gaze, ours and Carol's. They have to answer to us. We also, however, get a sense of the Avengers' power over Carol, the threat they represent as these super-strong heroes who betrayed her, who helped threaten her subjecthood. Look at how they loom over here, her here when she has to bend down to collect the lemonade. This is a tension this comic plays with. It plays with bringing us into Carol's sense of disempowerment, as well as her sense of power, which is, in this instance, less her ability to fly or punch people really hard than it is about her ability to contest her disempowerment, to assert her subjecthood in the face of friends who abetted this traumatic challenge to her subjecthood. The emphasis on Carol Danvers' face is also important. I could also personally do without the suggestion of hysteria and kind of the overblown dramaticness of her tears and shouting, but still... The emphasis on her face matters. We're focused on her reaction, on her emotions. We could even read the exaggeration another way as creating a kind of claustrophobia, particularly in this panel, in this panel here. We're trapped here in this overcrowded panel, if you'd focus just on this one. We can't, once again, escape her emotions. It's that duality, that play, again, with empowerment and disempowerment that I think is important about this comic. You might also think about the reference to female community that's woven into Carol Danvers' confession. The inclusion of Spider-Woman down the right here, and in general, um, Spider-Woman is the one who rescues Carol, of course, right? Spider-Woman's inclusion um, has at least, again, two sides. So on the one hand, it puts the onus on women to be the ones feeling these feelings and dealing with them. On the other hand, it's a gesture of empathy that acknowledges these betrayals as shared experiences that many women have in common. This empathy is largely missing, I would argue, from Avengers number 200. There's lots, lots more we could talk about with both of these issues, and I'm sure you'll do more talking about them in your class, but I want to leave you with something slightly more hopeful, which is Carol Danvers' identity as a survivor, and how that's become an important part of her feminist identity. We wouldn't have the Captain Marvel movie, um, the first Marvel Universe movie starring a female superhero after 21 films starring men, without the 2012 re-envisioning of Carol Danvers by writer Kelly Sue DeConnick. DeConnick pushed to resurrect Carol with a new costume, purpose, and mission, and a new name. This was when she finally became Captain Marvel. This comic also reinvigorated the character's feminist purpose, giving her a powerful sense of female community she'd been missing for decades. The first issue of DeConnick's re-envisioning also ends with a really lovely meta-commentary on the history of Carol Danvers as simultaneously Marvel's premier feminist superhero and one of its most mistreated ones. The issue ends with Carol Danvers flying into space as Captain Marvel to scatter the ashes of her mentor, a fictional flying ace named Helen Cobb. The text of a letter from Cobb is scrawled across the images, and I'll read it for you. When a soul is born with that kind of purpose, it'll damn sure find a way. We're gonna get where we're going, you and I. Death and indignity be damned, and we will be the stars we were always meant to be. Once, Carol Danvers was used to take us further away from a world in which women and girls can be the heroes they were meant to be. Now, finally, she's once again back, helping take us closer. 
Thank you so, so much for your time today. I know it was a bit heavy at points, but I really hope you enjoyed it. Um, you can find my writing about female superheroes lots and lots of places if you want to look me up. And I've also got a podcast with your professor called Three Panel Contrast, available wherever fine po podcasts are found. Thanks again, everyone. Stay happy, healthy, and safe.